Hi everyone, welcome to Custody Matters Live. My name is Danica Joan, and unfortunately Wendy is still out with um, and healing her eye. I know some of you may be following her posts, but um, she's, she's had surgery because of a detached retina. And uh, man, I just, I feel so sorry for her because I would not be, um, just, the, just having to put yeah. herself head face down for like days on end um you know like those chairs those massage chairs that you sit and you have face down i i bet she is so like not interested in doing any massages after she gets out of after she heals from that <laughs> um anyway so we have a guest his name is james mirafield and he is an, the author of define the odds and it, we, our conversation is all around blended families and step families. Welcome, James. Hey, thank you for having me, Danica. So, James, tell me a little bit about your your background and how it is that you decided that that to that the world needed to know a little bit more about blending families. Well, you know, going as far as, far as my background, you know, I really did come from humble beginnings. Um, I grew up in an environment, you know, that was that was just. Uh, you know, infested with gangs and infested with drugs, uh, infested with, uh, you know, violence, both in the home, outside of the home, you know, drug overdoses and, and uh, you know, and, and people just basically being exposed to all the things that, uh, that children at a young age should not be exposed to. And since I was just a little boy at about the age of five years old, you know, I was already putting together a blueprint for my life. You see, I've got my book right here to find the odds. There's a picture of a doorway right there. That doorway is a, uh, it's in a little, a, a little small side of a, an apartment building in Los Angeles. My dad went in there, it was like a tool shed and he converted it into a, a bedroom where we had a little twin size bed. We had a little black and white TV of us that would sit on a milk crate. And I remember being in that alleyway right there, looking out at the street at the age of five years old, just telling myself that there has to be more in life for us than this. Like, there's got to be something better for us. So at the age of five years old, I already started putting the blueprint together for my life. That told myself that when, I, when, I, when I'm of age, we're not going to be sleeping in the side of a, you know, in a little, in a little, uh, um, God, I don't know, I don't know what you want to call that, like maybe like a four- Eve, maybe I'd be yeah, about four foot by maybe six foot shed. You know, we're not, I'm not going to beat my wife. I'm not going to expose my kids to, you know, the alcohol abuse. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to be, uh, uh, you know, addicted to the hardcore drugs and, and have it be the death of me, like all the things that I've seen. You know, I'm not going to be, you know, involved in, in, you know, the bad things that go on here. So I was already putting together a blueprint for me, you know, for myself. You know, a, a being kid, as a kid, but parents, this is one thing. Children are very observant. And I was always watching little Johnny. And little Sally and little Johnny's family didn't behave like my family they didn't look like us and you know Sally's family was very well mannered their parents showed affection to one another and they were just so different and I always grew up thinking why couldn't we be like that why couldn't we you know uh, uh, be happy like that why couldn't we you know why couldn't the happiness be real like that like like it was with them so once again you know as, as a fast forward you know as a you know as, as the years went on in my life Things didn't smooth out overnight, you know. My my both my parents stood apart. They ended up in different relationships, and and those relationships weren't very healthy. And you know what they did? In turn, blended families. Um, they took away from me as a child. And at that point, you know, I definitely turned and I looked to I looked for love elsewhere. That's golden right there. Like parents, you've got to understand that in a blended family, any type of situation where you know custody battle or or, or you know when, when the parents aren't, aren't aren't getting along and they're not meshing. Their focal points are no longer on the children. Their focal points are on each other, fighting with each other, maybe competing with each other and, and that sort of thing. But somewhere the kids get lost in the shuffle. And when the kids get lost in the shuffle, keep in mind, the kids are the ones who need love at that time the most. So it's very critical, you know, for those individuals that are going through separation, those individuals that are going through, you know, uh, are, are, are putting together blended family. It's not always peaches and cream. Now, people always see me and my wife. Veronica, my son Cody, my son James, my daughter Ashley. Veronica will get this all the time from other women. I want what you have. And they'll see my pictures on Facebook and they see me out there, you know, on nice vacations with the kids in Hawaii, in the Bahamas, 
out on the golf course with my sons playing golf, out at the baseball games, enjoying life. And they always would tell me the same thing. James, I want what you have. I want that life. But they don't understand. They don't understand what it took to get there. And I think that the people nowadays, you know, the more work that's involved with getting to it, to that level, it's kind of a turnoff because it seems like in a throwaway society, people don't want to, people don't want to bust out the tape anymore and tape anything when it's broken. They don't want to get out the screwdriver anymore and, and just turn it just a couple of times and tie something up. No, they want to throw it away. And that's the same thing that is going on today in today's society to where 50% of marriages are ending in divorce well after, well before, I want to say well before, if not just after the second year. And if you're fortunate enough to remarry, that blended family failure rate is anywhere from 60 to 70%. So clearly we have a problem. We have a problem. We don't know how to fix problems anymore. You know, we don't know how to, we don't know how to resolve anymore. It's just a matter of, well, let's just get rid of it and start over. It doesn't work like that in a blended family relationship. Human beings uh, are, are definitely, you know, we may have all this technology and we may have all, all these new, new things that help us move faster, you know, in this day and age. But one thing that's never going to change is the human element in terms of us needing each other. Because without each other, like we're doomed. I mean, there, there's so many things that we need from each other. Like we need to hear, I love you very much. We need to, we need a hug. Like we need to touch, like there's, oh, there's, there's certain things that, you know, when, when, we, when we touch one another, we put our arms around one another, you know, we're genuine when we tell each other that we love each other. Those are things that you're not getting from your computer. You're not getting that from your Facebook. You're not getting that. We can say it all day on Facebook. Oh, I love you. That was a great post and that kind of thing. Hey, but I'm telling you right now, bottom line is, if we're not having that kind of interaction with each other, that one-on-one, -on -one, you know, that, that, uh, that togetherness, I'm not talking about technology, that's, that really is like a setup for, that's a setup for defeat in the home. Turn on the news. Look at all of the things that you're seeing that are going to go on the news right there. It's all negative. It's all bad. Okay. Team family starts in the home first. You have to build a solid foundation at home first. If you don't have a solid foundation at home you will not be very successful outside of the home. No matter what you're doing, no matter what, who you think you are, no matter what you're doing, you're going to be lacking something. If you don't have that success at home, you know, so I'm really big on, on the theory of team at, in, in home. I believe it starts in home. I'm, I'm real big on the theory of an all-inclusive environment, especially uh, in a blended family. I know several bl uh, blended families that, uh, you know, uh, for example, Sam, the man, uh, you know, definitely like an eight-figure earner, and, and he's and he's in a, and he's the head of a blended family. His wife that he married has a, has a child from a uh, um, a previous marriage. Uh, Sam and his new wife have two children from their previous marriage. That one daughter from the previous marriage uh, uh, from his wife, and I know this because I've talked to her on several occasions. and told me, hey, I don't feel right when I come around them. When I come around them, everybody gets real quiet. It's like they have their own little clique, and I'm not welcome. And that individual moved very far away out of state once you know once uh, 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 that person was old enough to go there and that's sad that is the ultimate one of the ultimate failures one of many but one of the ultimate failures and that's why an uh, all-inclusive environment and a blended family is extra critical if those kids want to get out there and jump on a on a uh, you know on, on a cell phone and exclude themselves from the group while the rest of the group's over here doing this parents as leaders, don't be afraid to go over there and take it away. Take it away. You're paying for the bill. Take it away. Put it in your pocket. Hey, little Eddie, come and join us. I mean, come on over here. Make Eddie feel welcome. Make that kid feel welcome. Because you know what I'm telling you, bottom line, you know what I mean? If you allow that to happen, you're allowing division to take place in the home. Team. I'm really big on the theory of team. And I've coached this. As a matter of fact, my nickname out on the streets amongst the corporate world, it's the coach. My, my nickname is so kind of funny how this thing kind of like, like dwindles off, but my nickname in my community has also been the coach because I coach people to success. Like I coach, I believe in the theory that team begins in the home. So everything that I've ever preached out there in the streets, everything that I've ever talked about, you know, in my community, everything that I've ever, I've ever, uh, um, you know, gone out there, I, whatever it is that I talk, I walk. And it first started here in the house. Yeah. I'm creating leaders in the house. Ashley Merrifield, my 23-year-old, my, my can stick and move 
like a grown woman already and is more well equipped to handle today's problems and the things that go on out there than most 23 year olds her age. Cody Merrifield, my oldest son, is overseas right now serving for our country. Cody is much more sharp and much more street fight competitive, much more uh, 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 well equipped to be out there on his own. And he coaches other, uh, other kids already that are, you know, in their mid 20s to late 20s to telling them, hey, this is what we did as a family. This is how, you know, this is, these are the things that we went through. This is what my dad taught us. This is what I'm, this is now, you know, basically what we're out teaching other people. Team starts at home. Team starts at home. Your wives, gentlemen, you cannot do it without them. No matter how awesome you think you are, no matter how breadwinner you think you are, ladies, vice versa, same thing. You cannot do it without each other. Team begins and ends at home. You know what I mean? So that's really critical, you know, in, in a blended family, not just a blended family, but in any family, you know, that you embrace that. I just happen to be, have a very successful blended family. So I've developed programs. You know, I've developed online courses. I've got one-on-one -on -one coachings. I've got group coachings. You know what I mean? Because I'm so passionate about this. My goal is to help over 100 million blended families have the same success that I have had, if not greater. I want to see them stay together. I want to see these families make it. You know, they obviously didn't make it in the first round. So, hey, you, who's to say that, you know, you don't deserve a second chance? Well, let's make it happen in the second. You know, we can make it happen. There can be a happy ending. There can totally be a happy ending to that story. But as a matter, but as you know, leaders in a blended family, we have to work together as a team in an all-inclusive environment to make these things take place. So you, you, so you said you have um, a, a group of coaches that work with blended families or individuals. I have, I, I basically am the spearhead uh, of the, uh, of the uh, uh, blended family coaching. I have a group of therapists uh, that have my back as well. Basically, mm -hmm. where as if and this goes per se that a young, a young lady had experienced a traumatic experience in her life to where maybe she was molested, maybe she was raped. Okay, I cannot help with that. I am not a therapist, but I have a group of therapists that are, that, that are on board with me that I can refer them to. So I don't want to tell anybody, oh, you know, I can't help you. I say, hey, you know, hold on a second. I cannot help you with that, but I have somebody that can. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, so you know, well, I'm, those are, those, that's where the therapists come in, you know, basically where they're going to take care of some of those traumatic experiences and things that, you know, I'm not, I'm not uh, licensed to do. Um, I really do believe that we can make a bad situation even worse, like if we don't have the right tool. So therefore, I do have the therapist uh, in place you know, to help me out with those, with those situations. Yeah. And I, I would think even though, okay, so not every situation warrants having to have a licensed therapist. A lot of times a that person is who is highly trained coach or cons a consultant can really guide the family um, so they can be grounded. So they're not swept up in the winds and the, the emotion of the conflict in the family. They can actually be grounded and yeah. I see that that the coach can provide that for sure. Absolutely, my, my you know my take has always been on that, um, uh, and no disrespect to the therapists and people that went to school with that, but you can go out there for three hundred, two hundred, fifty, three hundred dollars an hour and go get your kid a child therapist. If your marriage is in danger, you can go out there and get yourself, you know, that marriage counselor who's going to charge you two hundred and fifty dollars an hour, three hundred bucks an hour. Keep this in mind. Once again, no disrespect to those people. I know that I'm sure they worked hard with their education. But you need to, you basically need to deal and, and be led by people like myself who have been in the trenches, mm -hmm. who have been there and done it versus somebody who ducked their nose down in a book for about four years and is going to, is going to share with you what they read out of a textbook. You're going to have a textbook you're gonna, or versus, you know, a, a basically experienced professional. What do you, who do you prefer to learn from when it comes to things like this? Because I know, I know one thing's for sure. I can't have some 20-year-old some, uh, who has no children trying to tell me how to raise my children. I cannot have you know, a 25-year-old trying to, trying to you know, basically get in there and, and, and create some sort of you know, mediation for me and my wife when we're going through it when you're not even married. Right. You've never been married. You know what I mean? So, so you know, basically, there's really experience versus you know, that, that, uh, that, that person who is educated. Once again, no disrespect to them. That worked hard, and and I and I know that I, I would say in a, to a certain extent, yeah, they're passionate about helping people as well. But when it boils down to trust, when it boils down to you know to trust, you've got to go with the names and the people that you can quickly trust, and that's where 
you know, that's where James Merrifield comes in. I am, I'm, I'm very well experienced. I'm very well versed. I'm very well, you know, acclimated in the, in the, in the, uh, you know, what it takes to have a successful blended family. My program is called the successful blended family, you know, so, and, and we're, you know, we're that, we're that passionate about it. You know what I mean? To where, you know, we feel that, that we have something, we have something great to offer. You know, we really do have something, you know, really good to, to, to offer. We're different. We're different. You know what I mean? And, and I, I tell you, my trainings, my coachings are completely unorthodox, mm-hmm. completely unconventional. If the blended family failure rate is anywhere from 60 to 70 percent conventional methods of, of, uh, of training and learning are way outdated. They're yeah. way outdated and they're not fully relevant to what is going on today. Well, I feel that. A lot of it is because, you know, blended families, a lot of people have no clue that a blended family is a totally different animal than the original intact family. Yes. So many dynamics. And I, as a, I I came from an intact family, but my parents divorced in my mid twenties. And I remember the feelings of the loyalty conflict and, and the concern that my mom was going to be replaced or I was going to be replaced in my dad's heart when he remarried. Yeah. And I mean, all of these irrational feelings that you even have as an adult, imagine a child dealing with all of that. And, um, and you're right, whether it's the, the, the churches or even the people who are not uh, churched, they, they, Try, everybody tries to fit a blended family into the original intact family mold and they wonder why it all blows up and it's and it's a 60 to 70 percent failure rate there's going to be some pain <laughs> and that's something that like you know as far as you know the blended family thing like we're not it's not the first thing on the list you know what i mean that we're going to talk about when building a blended family but there's going to be some pain and that's gonna that's definitely something that you that people are going to have to be able to deal with. They're going to have to learn, you know, to navigate their way through that pain. Uh, a big part of that is going to come from, you know, bringing these two families together now. Tom, Tom's got two kids from a previous marriage. Jane has two kids from a previous marriage. Tom's has has a 13 year old boy and a 14 year old girl. Jane's got a seven year old son and a 17 year old boy. Both of these families, both of these children from the separate families, they have been reading out of a separate book their entire lives. Mm -hmm. So in a blended family, it's going to take the respect of every party to accept that and learn to accept one another for who we are. There are going to be some, there are going to be some definite uh, uh, differences in these blended families. Even speaking for myself, my wife and I came from two total different backgrounds. We both grew up in the inner cities of Los Angeles. She grew up in a very well-structured home. And I, I grew up in the complete opposite. No structure. She is, she, her, her, her personality, much more of a vibrant. She was much more, uh, just much more beautiful, like much more loving and much more, much more, uh, um, you know, willing to give people a chance. Me coming from the other side of town, I was a complete opposite. I'd been burned so many times. I had my heart broken so many times. I had a shield. I had a shield, I'm telling you, man, of just titanium around this heart. And I wasn't letting anybody get in. Our children that came a part of this, my, my children have been through a lot of traumatic experiences and never experienced the things that, that my wife had experienced. My wife with her loving heart, you know, brought that in. Some things were not easy uh, uh, for her to bring in. I've got to give her a lot of credit, a lot of credit for sticking it out with the kids. There were some difficult times where they didn't understand some of the things that, that she was trying to implement. And there were some times where they didn't fully disagree. Now that those kids, fast forward to now, are older, because Veronica stood her ground in those beliefs, they love Veronica so much that when something goes wrong now, they go to her before they come to me. And that for me is golden. I normally hear about like the trials and I hear about the obstacles and I hear about, you know, some of the, the, the hardships last because they go to Veronica first. Those are not her biological children. They will go to my wife before they go to their biological mother. That is how much trust they have and faith that they have in that, in, in, you know, in my wife, you know, so there's, once again, there's going to be some pain. There's going to be some, 
You know, there's, there, you've got to face it for what it's worth. And I'm going to use that word freely. There's going to be pain. And you're going to have to learn to navigate that. If you don't know that, that's where coaches like us are going to come in and really help you understand that. You know, when we come in, in, into the picture and, you know, you're asking us for help, we're in charge. We're in charge. Because if you had all the answers, I'll just pack up my stuff and I'll leave. And you go ahead and figure it out. But we're in charge. You know what I mean? When, when, uh, you know, when we're coaching and when we're teaching. And, you know, once again, we've got the experience. Who do you want to go with? You want to go with the name you can quickly trust. You know what I mean, that's James Merrifield versus going, you know, going in your Google and, 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 and looking for a therapist for, you know, for a, a marriage and just picking one of those and thinking that, you know, you're picking straws and you're just going to get lucky. It doesn't work like that. Yeah. You know, you need to go with experience when it comes time for, you know, uh, learning about the blended family. That success rate is only 30% maybe 40 if you're lucky. That's not good. That's not even, that's not even equivalent to flicking a quarter and, that thing, and you being able to call heads or tails. I mean, it's almost like a given to where, you know, I'm not going to get it. You know, oh, yeah. so, it, it, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to help. You know, I'm here to help. I've got a loving heart. You know, I'm very straightforward. I'm very, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm very, I'm, I'm very upfront with the tone and my demeanor is very strong. But I, I tell you what, of all the people that I've ever met in my life, and even people that come across me, they will tell you, James, you are truly one of the most genuine individuals I've ever met. And, that, and, I, and I feel like that's what it's all about. As long as I've been genuine and as long as I've, I've, uh, you know, I've given it 110 for you, I'm happy with that. I know I made a difference. Yeah, you know, I, I am such, I'm definitely a champion of coaching. Bringing a coach in that specializes in a particular area. I've, I've coached people myself most of it has been around custody situations where when a parent is going through a divorce and that there again, I definitely, whether you use, use us, whether you use somebody, do some research. Get, when you find yourself in, in survival mode, definitely look for a coach that can ground you. And that's, I think that's the difference. A coach is more a, a guide not necessarily, they're not diagnosing anything that's wrong. They're actually creating, setting you up for success. That is true. That, you know, you're, you're so very correct. I mean, I, I uh, you know, there's gotta be, to, 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 that, to a certain extent, there's gonna have to be some compatibility. You know, when we're, when we're doing this kind of business, there's gotta be some compatibility, meaning that, you know, we're going, you're going to have to be able to, you know, take in and absorb the things that I'm teaching because I am, my, my biggest take on this is when I coach, I'm telling people, I am not telling you what to do. Mm -hmm. I am simply telling you my recipe for success and what worked for us. This is what put us where we are. This right. is what created this dynasty. Okay. So that you, you know, you can, you can either, you can either take it or leave it, you know, but basically I'm giving you, I am giving you the recipe for success. If 30 yeah. to 40% of blended families are failing, and I'm telling you that, hey, this is what worked for us. You know, give it a shot. Give it a try. Give it a shot. What do you have? What right now at this point in your life, what do you have to lose? Yeah, you know, you have what there is on the other side without yes. support is the fact that your children grow up uh, remembering all of the dysfunction and what didn't work and how they survived childhood. So basically, you um, and and like in my situation, coaching people through their divorces, they actually get it done quicker with, and and more amicably, which is why the courts are all going to mediation. And it doesn't matter if it's family court or uh, any kind or any other kind of court. They're all directing their, them to mediation. Why? Because if you have a conversation and you try to work, you can either make the decision yourself or you can have the judge decide. Absolutely. A lot of pain and anguish. And in the family courts, you're not dealing with assets. You're dealing with hearts and futures. Yes. yes. I think that's, that's probably one of the most painful things uh, when going through the divorce. You know, like I said, I've been there. Um, the, kids are, the kids are very delicate. And if anything, I mean, they're, they're definitely trapped in the middle. So it's just a matter of, it's just a matter of, of uh, you know, mom and dad you know, really working together to come up with the best resolve for, you know, the sake of these kids. It's not a matter of, I mean, we've already, as parents, we've already decided, hey, you know, we're not going to be together. And we're not, we, we, uh, we just, we're not, we're not willing to do it anymore. But at the end of the day, I think the most important thing is just remembering that those kids that are tied up in the middle, you know, they're, they're going through a lot. I don't think that the, uh, that their emotions are, are, are truly being taken under consideration. 
you know, when, when these types of things take place, and I know this, I speak from experience, you know, when, when uh, parents are more so focused on competing with one another, uh, they're more so focused on who's going to get the upper hand and that sort of thing. And who's almost to, to where it's sickening to where who is going to dictate the other person's life, even though we're still not together and they're not focusing, you know, on, on the children, the children ultimately at the end of the day are the ones that suffer. They're going to grow up with, you know, several things that, uh, they're never going to forget. And some of these things can take several years to, uh, to correct. Some of these things will not correct ever. Some of these things will never go away. And I think that that is the, uh, that is definitely one of the key, key takeaways, you know, that, that parents need to know when going through this divorce that now, just like what you said, if, uh, you know, we go through mediation, if we can work things out, you know, I think it's, I, I know it's easier said than done because I've been there. I've been heated before, but it's, it's always, you know, just it, it, through mature, through a mature set of eyes now, it's best that we do what's best for the children at the end of the day. They're what truly matters. Like that child is, is, is going to be a part of your heart forever. You know what I mean? So definitely, you know, I'm a big, I'm a big supporter of, of, uh, you know, mediation for the right causes. And, you know, I have, I know people who have gone through horrible divorces and, uh, and I get that horrible things were done. But a lot of times a parent, it's hard for them to, to detach from the abuse they uh, felt like that they received from their ex. And so what they'll do is say, I don't want you in my life and I don't want you in my children's lives. Yes, that, that, that is, that's true. And it's that just, is true. And they don't get the future they're creating for their children. They're creating a future of, you know, when a child does not have a love and affinity for both parents. Uh, and, and the opportunity to get to know them, um, then it's like they're missing something inside of themselves. They don't know where they got their brown eyes or where they got their left-handedness or, or whatever because they don't have access to that side of themselves. And, and of course, that side of themselves is wrong and bad because they've been told it by the other parent. Yeah. Um, and I'll tell you, the future, and I always bring up the future that's like the predictable, almost certain future of a child who's had one parent marginalized from their lives is they may repeat the cycle. Unknown. There it is. There it is. You hit it right in the face. It's breaking the cycle. You know what I mean? Like that's what, you know, that's what, what Define the Odds was all about. That's what Define the Odds was all about. Breaking the cycle. You know what I mean? Just being, being persistent. In fact, I was so passionate about it. I even uh, I even went out and I and I had the book published and and uh and put together in Spanish, you know, I mean because it's all about it really is breaking the cycle. Like, you know what I mean like like that's you hit it right in the face like you could have said it any better. You know, it took it took a lot of it took a lot of hard work throughout my entire life to break the cycle, and and I got to tell you if you ask me about you know one of the the biggest things that I'm most proud of in my life it was doing just that breaking the cycle, it was creating a do a brand new Maryfield, it was creating a brand new, you know, foundation. It was creating, you know, a, 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 almost like, how do I say it, like little soldiers, like, you know, a, a Cody and Ashley and James, you know I mean, and, and bringing a new breed, you know, of, of, of Maryfield into this world. And I, and that's, uh, that was very motivating for me. It, it was everything to me. If you ask me like, James, like, what was your, you know, your life's, your life's purpose up until this point, I would tell you, it was to break that cycle and create a, and create a, uh, a brand new Maryfield, you know, a brand new, you know, group of people to go into this world and, and to, you know, to spread good and to do good and, and to lead by example. You know, that, that's, uh, you hit it right there, breaking the cycle. Awesome. I like that. Well, we, we just have a few more minutes and I, and I know you shared off air. Uh, I want you to share with us what uh, your family, what you've been of contribution to in the Caribbean in the last few weeks. Well, uh, I just happened to get on a, uh, just happened to jump on a jet plane with uh, with Mr. Gary Cox, and uh, you know Gary was up there riding shotgun, driving the plane, and you know I'm I'm sitting in the back, and it, it was such an it was such a good thing, it was such a good adventure. You know, uh, uh, what we did is we loaded up a private jet to the rim with goods for the of uh, relief for the survivors of the hurricane in the Bahamas. Um, it was very moving for me. It was very. It was very. It was just one of those things that that knowing that you were a part of something, those people will never be able to pay us back. It's it's not about the payback. Mm -hmm. Those people 
were so grateful that we showed up to do this. And I mean, even though even though I was working, I was in that plane sweating my, you know what, off, you know, grabbing uh, uh, grabbing cases of this and throwing stuff out the door. And you know, Gary was hanging out right there at the at the door and you know throwing stuff to the people down there. I mean, you just had this big chain of you know, people of, um, out there willing to help. You know, the U.S. Navy got out there and they were bringing helicopters back and forth. You know, I mean, with delivering, with delivering the product and landing in, you know, the tough spots for us. So I was so grateful to do that. 45% of those people um, lost their homes. Over half the population there, were uh, they were undocumented. Now, with winds blowing at 240 miles an hour, that was somebody's mother that got swept into that ocean, somebody's son, somebody's brother, somebody's uncle, somebody's grandma. Um, that was the hard reality for me. On the way back, on the way back to the jet uh, at night, there was a gal, bohemian gal that was driving the Suburban. And she said to me, she says, James, I cannot believe how much, I cannot believe how much. No, she says, y'all really love us that much. Mm -hmm. I said, yeah. She says, like y'all left your families and you came over here to do all this for us. And it just shows us over here that like, we're not miles away, that people truly care. We're just shocked to see like how many people just flew in and out of these airports to do these kind of things for us. And, you know, we're not afraid to be out there on the front line with us, like during our time of need. And I went home on that note after a long, like a long exhausting 12 hour day. And I, and just on the way back on the plane, you know, as we're driving over the cold, cold still of the night, you know, going back into Florida, flying back into uh, that, that area. Um, I just, it was just, it was just, it just kept replaying back in my mind how grateful the Bohemian people were, mm -hmm. how happy they were to have us do that. You know, so that was, that took place in the Caribbean. We, we did that last week. I flew into Florida on a Sunday, uh, hung out for uh, us on, on Monday, met up with some of my friends in, in Florida. They came on down, had some dinner. And then first thing in the morning, boom, it was game on. You know, we, we had to be at the airport, you know, and then that jet was up in the air. Like, you, everything's timeline. You know, I mean, when you're jumping on a jet, you got to be out, out the door, you know, past a certain airspace at a certain time. And it was just game on. It was it was time to do, you know, what we set out to do. So that was wonderful. And even I, I'd even taken it a step further. You know, I sponsor a family out in uh, Ote, uh, Tijuana. And I told them, I says, I am coming on Friday. As tired as I was, like as much drag and as much things that I had going on in my personal life and I made a commitment to going out there, and I, on this trip, I took my son James with me, my youngest. I wanted him to see what went on on the other side of that border. So we passported up, crossed the line, and, and went over there, and we did it again. You know, took some relief to those, those families out there. Um, Tijuana is very, very, I mean, just uh, in Ote, we're talking the slums. We're talking two picks are holding up houses with, like, plastic bags for, for rooftops and and dirt on the floor, you know, where, where the where the bugs and the cockroaches are at. I mean, this is the reality and what goes on, you know, on the other side of that over there. So I've been on a mission lately. You know, I've been expanding. I just have been expanding, uh, sharing the love and sharing the, you know, the wealth, you know, with those people who need it the most. You know, we always will say things. I've got this too. Where we talked about, you know, where people would kind of attack and somebody would still have something negative to say about, you know, what it is I've done. Well, James, there are people that are here home and, uh, in our own home homeland here in the, you know, America that needed, you know, why are you doing that? Those people that say that are the same people that when my wife's cleaning out the refrigerator, I will tell her, don't throw that away. Set all that stuff to the side. I will drive over to the West side of town and I will find somebody who will eat that food. And I jump in the car, cruise down to the West side. I take my little son, James with me. He's my wingman. He's my, he's my, uh, he's my partner in crime. And, I'm, and I'll tell you, I'll say, James, well, who, who can we give this food to? And James is out there looking, goes, that guy over there, Dad, let's go, let's go get him. And that's really, for me, just knowing that, hey, you know, that whatever, half a pan of lasagna that was going to go in the trash and fed somebody and fed a couple of people a night that, you know, weren't, that had no idea where their next meal was going to come from. So yeah, I would get, say. get out there and do something good. I'm telling you right now, if you want to feel real good about yourself, get out there and do something good for somebody that, that you know is never going to be able to repay you back. Do it. And let your ca kids catch you doing it. Yeah, get them involved. Get them involved. Take them with you. I made, I made Cody do it too. Yeah. I made my own son Cody do it too. Went to Jack in the Box, bought a bunch of tacos and burgers and drove them down to a, a place called the Airplane Park. And I said, go on, Cody, get out. That's go right. give him some food. He's hungry. I guarantee you. You ask him if he's hungry and he's not going to shoot you down. Go on. Go feel what that feels like. Yes. You know, it all, it, once again, it starts in the home.
Mm-hmm. Just like I said at the beginning of this interview, it starts in the home. Whatever it is that we do here is going to reflect whatever takes place out there. So do good. And they're all going to be, you know, the kids are watching. They're watching what you, what you do more than what, the, what you say. Absolutely. Um, and I say, and just one last note about the Bahamas is uh, one thing that you can do if you're not able to, if, if you had a trip planned to go to the Caribbean, go on a cruise or whatever, keep that going because many of the people who are homeless, that what sustained them is tourism. Big time. That's their bread and butter. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Tourism is their bread and butter. All right. Thank you, James, so much for being on the show. Uh, been, I know that our viewers really got so much out of it. And um, wow, I, I hope someday I will be able to meet you in person. Absolutely. Next time you're in California, if you're ever in beautiful Southern California, you give me a call. We love to entertain and that's what we like to do. I, oh, I'll hold you to that. <laughs> do it. Please do. All right. Take care and thanks for watching Custody Matters Live and we'll see you again next week. Bye now.